Bunki in the Kitchak Shechek, Yelena Radva, Yelena Radva, Mikimundurn Zilla, Turkian and Bilkent Universal, Nan Halkaragat Nashkar Berlin Nutoran, Utoran, no high honors were merit based scholarship plan, Utorpter, scholarship plan or captor, or not on Kimungatan Zilla also. American University at Washington DC, American Patriot, American University of uh, International Affairs Berlin and Magistur of Nalan, where you came on out in Zeal, in a Master of Administration, Strategy and Marketing, Western Governors University. You came on out to Dan Bear Walsh, American Fleur Deeper Company at Nashereket in the Turlu Wedi Peller de Ishlan, Schwatki. With the uh, project manager, Glob global government services. Yelena Kup, Thawal Bivulen, Tijri and Pilar Shemuchin. We're eager to hear what you say. Your uh, mic is off. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Great. Thank you so much, Vepa, for the introduction and uh, my greetings to all the participants. Let me share my screen real quick. Give me just one second. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm very pleased to participate today and uh, thank you for the, uh, this opportunity. So um, as Vipa has mentioned that uh, I have been working in a business corporate environment for the past uh, 14 years um, for a large engineering and construction company that's uh, on the list of um, Fortune uh, 500. And as many of you probably know, it's an annual list uh, published by Fortune magazine that uh, ranks uh, largest US corporations based on their total uh, revenue. So companies like, uh, uh, Amazon, Apple, uh, General Motors, Boeing uh, are on that list, uh, just to name uh, a few that, uh, that everybody's familiar with. Um, and to give you a little bit of context, uh, the company that I work for called uh, Floor Corporation, uh, they employ uh, 47,000 people uh, and have uh, more than 50 offices around uh, the world and 18 billion in revenue um, just last year. So I wanted to share some experiences and uh, lessons from my time in the business world. And uh, my presentation has kind of two parts to it. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, kind of individual career in a corporation, and then I will talk about uh, kind of companies um, themselves. So as far as careers um, at large corporations go, they can be very diverse, very interesting. And uh, one doesn't necessarily need to have a business degree to find work. Um, and that's kind of what I didn't know when I started. My degree was in international relations, but uh, a lot of the skills uh, uh, that uh, many of us learn in school are actually very valuable in corporate environment. Um, things like writing, presentation, language skills are obvious ones, but also math and finance come in very handy to assess um, financial situations and information. So I think a background in political science or international relations can be very relevant um, as large companies track political developments and have departments dedicated to government relations. So uh, I personally didn't know anything about uh, business when I started. So lesson number one, as you can see on the slide, is um, when it comes to a degree, one can think outside the box and apply your skills in uh, different, many different industries. Um, so the first few months at any job are all about, of course, you know, learning and adjusting. And at Fortune 500 company, I think it's amplified. Um, the organizational structure, it's very complicated. It tends to be of what's called matrix type. So that means one manager, uh, you, you will have one manager for functional work and one for um, operational projects. One can also get special assignments that report to an entirely uh, different branch of the corporation. So you learn very quickly to report to multiple people at once and uh, juggle many different priorities daily. 
So uh, a great benefit, I think, in a large company is going to different projects. For starters, you get to travel, which is great. I love traveling. Um, the project experience in construction industry is very, very valuable. Um, many employees like to participate, for example, what we call a transition period. And that's um, the first uh, three to six months on a new project. And it's being set up, it's tremendously fast paced um, environment, very demanding, and it provides uh, you know, very interesting learning opportunities. Um, so training and talent development is actually taken very seriously at most Fortune 500 companies. And there's a significant uh, budget to cover these costs. Um, so there are many internal trademarked tools that are developed for these purposes. For instance, our company has an online university, which is a tool that um, uh, holds thousands of courses on any relevant discipline. And there's also another um, uh, online repository called Knowledge Online that stores technical knowledge uh, from our experts uh, on things like engineering, construction, commissioning, uh, modular construction and so on. And uh, there's usually a separate budget that's devoted to uh, industry events, trade shows, sponsorships, you know, co different conferences, things like that. And uh, also if employees choose to go back to school, for example, I wanted to get my business degree uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they encourage it very much. So I went back to get an MBA degree and there are uh, tuition reimbursement programs that are available for employees, which are um, great. Um, so uh, one gets to learn about also very different diverse subjects, for example, risk management, compliance, project controls, those are disciplines that uh, may not be taught in college uh, as a separate class, but uh, they are essential in the business world. Um, there are many interesting uh, fields that you can discover and you can make, uh, you know, an entire career out of, for example, when I started uh, I was in marketing, but then I got interested in risk management and quality control and I transferred to, um, to do other things. So another valuable lesson here is one never stops learning in a corporate environment, whether it's you know, professional development, courses, training, certificates, or sometimes like I mentioned, going back to school. Um, so the great thing about working for a large company is if you don't like your current position, you can switch uh, career tracks. As I mentioned, I started in one discipline and then um, went on to other things. Um, so many companies offer rotational assignments and it's basically, you know, you can spend a, a year or two in a different field or a different project and see if you like it. So this helps, uh, you know, a person have a better understanding of the interconnectedness of various disciplines. So you don't only see like one little portion uh, of work that's done and you can see how they support the entire organization and push forward with accomplishing work. So I think an important lesson here is don't just focus solely on what you can offer to the company, but study the requirements and the strategic direction that the company is taking to stay relevant to their needs and uh, see if there are any um, new opportunities that you haven't considered before. Um, so soft skills development is really important in corporate world. I did not think much about it at all um, in the beginning. When I started, I was focusing more on business skills or technical skills. But um, as a manager, I actually learned um, a lot of soft skills, for example, listening, persuading, delegating, managing uh, stress, resolving a conflict, um, mentoring another employee, all of these skills um, were utilized for me at some point in my career. And companies actually pay a great deal of attention to these skills, particularly if um, they think that an employee can be prepared for a role of future leader and they think that you, know, you will be promoted in the company. So they often partner with outside entities. For example, our company um, uh, provides a lot of courses um, through Harvard Business Publishing and other consulting firms to offer leadership skills programs. 
Um, corporations regularly evaluate their strategic direction and come up with new initiatives that are uh, very exciting to participate in. So volunteering for any assignment that comes one way uh, and being at the forefront, forefront of new initiatives um, can establish a very good reputation for the employee. For example, uh, I always said yes to everything. Any new project, any new assignment, I always said, yes, I can do it. Um, even if I had no idea what I was getting myself into, um, I just kind of figured it out and learned in the process. So another approach that always works is not being afraid to recommend process improvements. Even if it's not taken, you uh, then people think about you as a very proactive person. So a lesson here for consideration is getting out of your comfort zone, volunteering, uh, challenging yourself is always seen as a positive attitude, uh, attribute. Um, so aside uh, from a specific uh, company values, now one must pay attention to whether the company is traditional or progressive. So if you are, you know, very young, modern uh, employee, you want to maybe telework, innovate, you, you want to use Twitter and social media at work, then you need, you know, one type of company. Uh, if you like more traditional setup, reporting, hierarchy, regular business hours, then that's a different type of company. And corporate traditions, um, they can range from something like very simple as office setup to something much more complex like company values. So for instance, a company, one company may prefer loyalty and another one may prefer that you be a very innovative thinker. So, and I, of course, I realize that, you know, it is a very big luxury for most of us to choose where you work, but this is something that you can consider. If you, uh, if you have a couple of different offers and you're thinking which one to choose, don't think just about um, your salary, but think also about values. Uh, will you be comfortable uh, working for this company? Does the company invest in employee development? Does it donate to charity? Does it have a diversity plan? Um, so the lesson here is find the company values out before you start, if you can. So this is kind of my first um, part of the presentation. Uh, so all of what I just shared was more about the individual career development. Uh, but corporations themselves, they tend to be evolving entities. And change is the only constant in corporate world. Uh, managers can leave very quickly. Departments are eliminated sometimes. Uh, parts of companies get sold completely. So sometimes one is swept off in a kind of massive wave of, of change. Some people have, um, I found, kind of very cynical view of corporations that they are uh, greedy machines that only care about their bottom line and how much money they make. Uh, and other people have an opinion that corporations are actually very productive social structure, offering jobs, producing products and services, and contributing to social causes. Uh, I think the truth is um, somewhere between these two extremes. Um, no company is perfect. There's always more uh, work to be done. Uh, but I think that most of the companies, they, um, they try to improve daily to attain their goals and uh, hold hold their values. So what do companies generally care about? I think number one is customer service. It's one of the most important factors for a corporation, regardless of you know, industry or type. So it's attained by executing each project uh, on time, on budget, and providing quality service or product. So <clears throat> for some companies, um, repeat business and customer referrals are very important. So the focus is more on relationship marketing. And for others, uh, quickly moving into new markets and establishing good relations with new customers is at the forefront. So what you see on the slide is just uh, a few kind of indicators of customer service that companies tend to pay a, a great deal of attention to. But either way, customer satisfaction needs to be a very prominent approach. Uh, profitability is, of course, um, another important consideration. So taking into account um, all financial measures is critical to success of the organization. Um, 
each corporation must not only satisfy its shareholders if it's a public company, but also needs to consider a sound financial strategy. So for example, would it invest a certain budget to um, research and development, or does it want to um, make an acquisition to, um, to enter into a new market? How much uh, cash reserves should it keep? Um, should it finance a project through debt? So many factors influence uh, financial health in a corporation um, that uh, in the finance department needs to keep a very close track of overall company strategy to, uh, to understand how company goals translate into cash flows, income statements, into kind of overall financial uh, picture. Um, there are valid reasons to include both financial and non-financial measures when you develop your company strategy. First and foremost, uh, financial information does not exist in a vacuum. So final numbers are the outcome of multiple complex interactions and processes within the company. So lesson learned here, um, without a deep understanding and appreciation of the story of the company, um, that goes behind the financials. These numbers uh, are absolutely meaningless. So this brings us to next slide, which is strategy. Uh, I put a very nice quote here that I really like. Um, I think strategic focus is extremely important for corporations. Uh, according to management experts, one of the core management functions is planning. No company ever pursues just random projects. They don't say, oh, you know, there's this new contract on the market, we should go for it. Absolutely not. Sound portfolio strategy needs to have a, a good mix of complementary service lines to diversify its offering in order to offset any um, potential losses in one of the markets. So generally, companies focus on five-year goals, and they closely monitor them through the, um, the application and tracking of specific metrics for each of those goals. So establishing a clear strategic vision and framework is beneficial uh, from many perspectives from a company. First of all, employees experience leadership firsthand. Um, companies aim at motivating their employees, not just through you know, salary, monetary incentives, but also through uh, making sure that employees understand the values. And strategy is one of the ways that you can understand what your company is, um, is trying to accomplish. Uh, second, strategic framework enables uh, clarity of purpose and helps define work of all functional departments, which brings us to <clears throat> the next slide, which is cohesiveness of purpose and drive for results. So if you have broken departmental links and competing agendas within your company, it's extremely detrimental. So sometimes due to the size and complexity or organizational bureaucracy in large companies in, or in Fortune 500 companies, there's an intricate hierarchy of approvals for every single decision that goes through. And this is an important element because it's aimed at ensuring reliable and predictable behavior within the company. But unfortunately, the side effect is often that this system of checks and balances has a negative implication uh, because of delayed decision making and uh, sometimes lack of innovative solutions. So as a manager, one needs to uh, navigate these interdependencies of various departments to receive necessary resources. Um, taking into account that teams have a life of their own is also a good reminder in the corporate world. Uh, as a leader, you need to watch and manipulate team dynamics, harness the power of a team, um, and uh, so another lesson learned here, I didn't put it on the slide, but if you want to rise to the leadership, you have to know how to relate to people, how to motivate, how to inspire. That kind of goes back to the soft skills um, that I mentioned before. Um, so I'll say a few words on globalization and multinational corporations. So this is not a new topic at all. Um, and uh, it kind of doesn't have a consensus, but I think it's one that's being revisited in the current um, uh, political and economic climate where some countries prefer to uh, maybe shrink back from their international roles and maybe exit some international organizations. 
So <clears throat> globalization often um, allows firms to grow consistent with their strategy, uh, but also it opens them up to very large international markets and creates economies of scale. Multinational corporations tend to benefit from global interdependence, but they also impact it um, uh, with their activities across the borders and linking different markets. So as policy uh, makers in the US and other countries consider how to stimulate economic growth and provide competitive wages, uh, they have to work with these types of corporations a lot, very closely. And uh, vice versa, companies um, also need to monitor uh, new laws and legislation that can impact their activities and trickle down to their contracts. For instance, um, uh, as focus in the United States right now is more on protectionism, we see in our company more and more provisions um, in our contracts regarding what's called Buy American Act, which is basically, um, it means that the U.S., um, made products are preferred. So when we work with suppliers, this is something that we have to consider. So there are a lot of other factors such as, you know, trade tariffs, tax breaks, uh, you know, trade embargoes and so on. And multinational corporations have a lot of uh, interest and um, a lot of weight in influencing foreign policy through their lobbying activities. So multinational corporations account for uh, one third of world output and GDP and two thirds of international trade, according to last year's statistics that I saw. Um, in general, multinational corporations have some positive impact on promoting growth, creating new jobs, um, you know, creating new networks of trade, bringing new investments into developing countries and maybe integrating them a little bit more into global economy. So it can boost some countries' comparative advantages, but there's, I think there's more research uh, needed to see if there's an equitable distribution of benefits between developed and developing countries. There is for sure some, uh, you know, some transfer of knowledge, some employment opportunities and, and uh, interactions between you know, multinational corporation and local um, firms, but when it comes to uh, policy making, I think that international regime for trade and investment remains uh, somewhat fragmented and we need a broader set of policies to govern movement of people, um, intellectual property, taxation and um, you know, other regulations. Um, so, of course, all of us have struggled with um, impacts of COVID-19 this year and corporations are not an exception. Uh, a controversial subject in this case is whether or not uh, government aid is appropriate for companies. So for U.S. companies under uh, CARES Act, it's, a, um, it's an act called Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security. Um, companies are receiving aid in the forms of credits, payment delays, and interest deductions. This, this is... Um, uh, the government is trying to ensure that uh, the businesses generate, continue to generate cash flow and liquidity. They keep businesses open and maintain, uh, you know, employment. So public companies in this environment need to consider extensive disclosures detailing the impact of this legislation in filings submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this uh, economic and social crisis has created uh, an unprecedented operational and financial challenges for corporate um, leaders. So they need to consider um, you know, their employees, stakeholders, uh, communities, customers, and they also have to, of course, continue to try to make money in this changing environment. So the course of action may be very different depending on the industry and the service offering, but uh, I guess a few things that almost all companies, particularly international ones, are dealing with, and I've listed them here on this slide, um, is you know, telework, adjusted um, hours of operations, um, suspended travel, keeping some projects delayed or suspended, um, creating community relief funds, uh, thinking about customer accommodations, for example, um, providing discounts or price cuts, providing health and safety guidelines to their employees, distributing additional equipment and supplies to their employees, such as you know, masks and uh, hand sanitizers and things like that, maintaining uh, affected supply chains, um, increasing employee communications so that employees also are aware of what the company is 
trying to do, and uh, sometimes in some cases, pay cuts. So there's a new Forbes uh, ranking that came out in May, at the end of May, that um, assesses how well the 100 largest employers among the US public companies mobilized to respond to this pandemic. So each company was rated on a scale of one to five in um, 22 different categories. And it was things like telework, you know, making sure that um, sick leave is available, daycare um, options are available for employees, things like that. So Verizon actually is the company that made the top of the list. They committed 54 million to nonprofit organizations, had not laid any of their employees. Um, they offered extra compensation for full-time employees that are still out in the field. So um, they, did, um, they did very well. So this topic um, is uh, actually also ties in uh, with the subject of corporate social responsibility or what's known as CSR for short. Um, so this is a model of business self-regulation uh, it's based on ethical standards of society in the areas of business conduct, legal compliance, and sustainability. So um, you might ask, well, why do corporations care about these things? Uh, corporations uh, engage in CSR for many different reasons, pragmatic, ethical, strategic reasons. Their reputation is on the line if they don't, uh, if they don't consider these things. So CSR is very important to the capabilities, their competitive advantage, um, as I mentioned, reputation, brand, um, and financial performance as well. So companies need to consider activities like bribery and corruption, insider trading, money laundering, competition laws, trade controls, patent and trademark um, regulations, domestic laws of host countries. So references to full and fair disclosure um, of financial information point to um, mandatory adherence to such uh, important laws in the United States as Sarbanes-Oxley and other um, publicly held company requirements. So protection of, of client and employee data, it's very important too. It requires attention to security and um, strict IT policies. So generally, most corporations have a very stringent ethics and compliance program that addresses all these subjects. Um, so lesson learned here is that companies are an integral part of social and economic framework and need to abide not just by laws and regulations of the country, but also implicit um, ethical standards. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to comments and questions. Let me stop sharing my screen and then I can see questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my first question is, I guess you are doing, your company does most of the government contracts. So our company actually has some commercial divisions as well. Uh, they, uh, in the commercial world, what they do is they um, provide construction services to um, oil and gas companies. So like they work with uh, corporations, other corporations like ExxonMobil, for example. Um, they do a lot of uh, contracts uh, in the Middle East for oil and gas. They do um, a lot of mining in South America. But specifically for me, I work in the uh, federal division. So we only deal with the US federal uh, customers. So the customers that we have include Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security. And depending on who your customer is, um, we can do very, very diverse work. Um, for example, Right now, I, I work for um, Department of Homeland Security contracts, and we actually don't do construction per se, but what we do um, is a lot of construction inspections, site inspections. So for example, if there's a large disaster in the United States or a hurricane or tornadoes, you know that happens here a lot, especially on the East Coast. Um, so our company, after the disaster, we have um, consulting specialists, construction experts that go in to assess the situation on the ground. For example, 
there are some public buildings that got destroyed, um, schools or you know courthouses, offices, and so on. Um, and uh, we assess the damage, we provide site inspections, and then we write reports on, um, on what needs to be done. And then we also have to consider, of course, environmental regulations, uh, historical preservations, for example, if there's any kind of archaeological site um, there, then we need to consider archaeological requirements. Um, so there's a lot of just different different types of expertise that, that goes into it. I think you're muted. Yes, sorry. Um, we have a question. What is your suggestion for a new graduate in project management? Does your company currently hiring? I think uh, someone wants to work for your company. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, absolutely. If it, I mean, if it's okay, you can share my uh, my email address, and I'm happy to uh, you know connect with anyone who's interested one on one and kind of provide um, provide some advice. So as I mentioned, you know, our our company has a lot of um, offices, in not just in the United States but across the world, and uh, you know they also uh, work in in our region. If people are interested in that, they don't have. Um, any current uh, contracts in Turkmenistan, but you know they work. Um, they work in Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan. They have an office. They work in Russia also. Um, but if it's for United States, uh, our headquarters are in Texas. We have a couple of different offices in Texas. It's Dallas and Houston. Um, so you can check um, Floor's website. It's a floor.com. F L U O R. Dot com, um, and there's a section there um, for you know potential employment, um, and you can check depending on kind of not just location but also um, what type of um, employment you are interested in. You know you can um, you can do marketing, you can do operations. Um, you also have to consider whether you know you want to travel a lot or not. So for example, if um, if you have construction expertise, uh, they would probably want you to um, go out more on projects. And so projects tend to be, of course, depending on the project, it can be anywhere from one year up to maybe five years. So you have to consider, are you okay with relocating? You know, if you have a family, for example, it's a little bit harder to relocate. Um, but then some people prefer that they like to travel and kind of change environments. So um, if you have your contact information on your slides, can you put it on so people can see when they I, see YouTube? I don't have it on my slide, but let me type it into chat. Uh, no, this is the thing. Chat would disappear after your presentation. So if you could, can put it on uh, on a new slide, your contact sure. information, so people uh, may connect or uh, contact you. While you're doing it, let me ask another question. Does your company, uh, sorry, not your company, does company culture is more val valuable than salary? Would going from one jo job to another make sense solely for financial reasons in your opinion? So, in so, your okay. Let me. I hope the question is clear. Yes, so let me just very quickly share my screen so you guys can see my email address. Can you see that? Yes. So um, the question is, I guess, what is more important, the company values or the financials? Yes. So uh, I, I think um, you have to consider everything. It's not just the salary and not just the company values. Those are kind of the two things that I mentioned. But you also have to think, you know, a lot of other things, your commute, your business hours, um, you know, your um, office employees, are you getting along with any with everyone? So of course, some things, you know, are very difficult to assess if you're just going uh, for a couple of interviews. Um, you generally, what you, what I was doing is I, um, I checked the, of course, the website of the company was my, you know, first thing um, to look through, um, and I really like that the company is international. 
uh, that there's a lot of you know diversity. So that was important to me. Um, the other thing is you can just Google the company and see kind of what comes up. So there's uh, different websites that um, assess companies uh, in terms of uh, employee satisfaction, I guess. Um, so there's, uh, for example, Glassdoor is one that um, generally you can go in and you, you, know, you basically do a search for the company and you can see a lot of different comments from people who already worked for that company. So you can see you know, what they liked, what they disliked, what kind of concerns they had. And so if you have, for example, similar concerns, then maybe that's kind of a red flag for you. That's a, you know, kind of a stop sign, so to speak. Um, so um, of course, financial uh, implications, you know, your salary is, is very important too. So sometimes it's a trade-off. Um, and I know uh, some people would prefer a smaller salary, but working for a company that they really respect. And then some people say, well, you know, let me try this and see if it works out. The, the, the salary is good. Um, and of course, you know, if if you're if you start working for a company and you say this is just not my environment, this is not my place. I don't like um, where the company's going, and you know it's not interesting for me. Then, you know, you kind of have to make that decision. Sometimes it's difficult, but um, you have to move on and uh, try and find something else. The second question is: What is the biggest mistake, if you ever did, uh, you've made on a project? or uh, your work experience it can be yeah. yes so um for me i think i was uh, in a difficult situation once i was working for a manager that that had a very difficult personality so he didn't he he wanted me to kind of stay within certain lines that he drew for me um and so a, a couple of mistakes that i made is um, I was also always very kind of interested in what other departments are doing. Um, so I started asking around and I wasn't trying to, you know, um, change my position, but I was just uh, asking out of curiosity and he heard that I was asking and he was, you know, extremely dissatisfied. He said, do not do that again. Um, so for me, Kind of the lesson learned is you have to always make sure that you know um, you understand your manager's personality very well, what he's comfortable with, what he's not comfortable with. Um, he liked very clear, you know, line of direction. So that was very um, that was very important. Um, and then um, sometimes you you get into situations. For example, um, I manage six people now, and. Um, I, uh, I had a call with our client to get their feedback on how our team is doing. And we got some, um, some feedback that wasn't so great. Um, and um, so I had to somehow relay that to, to our team. And that's a very delicate situation. Um, so, and that's something that I think you learn with experience, you know, it just, it doesn't sometimes come right away, especially if you don't have a lot of experience um, managing before. So I talked to one of our employees and I said, look, you know, we are now all working in uh, from home because of COVID and your productivity has dropped a little bit. And that's what the client said. So you need to make sure um, that um, you, um, you kind of pick it up, uh, make sure that you're always online, that you communicate with our client uh, a lot. And uh, he got upset about this feedback. So um, he actually called the client back. So that's something that's a no, no uh, in our situations. You know, you don't want uh, them complaining to the customer. Um, so that was, uh, that's something that's sometimes very difficult to manage because everybody has different personalities. So in your conversations with people, you have to make sure that you know what can tick them off. If they have a big ego, then they won't take 
feedback very well, you know. Um, so, so a lesson learned for me there was just make sure to uh, to have different approaches to different personalities. Um, I have a question. You're working for the same company since 2006? Yes. Have you considered changing uh, your company or why didn't you, why did you stick up, uh, stick with uh, Fleur for th this long? It is common, it. Because in the US it is very common to change companies in two to three years or at least get some offers and this and that. So. Yes, I, I agree. That's that's a great question. Um, so, and a lot of people have asked me that before. They said, "Well, wait a minute. You've been working in the same place for fourteen years. Number one, aren't you bored? Number two, aren't you scared that you know when you do need to go out, um, that people will will be concerned?" Um, and I actually have to say that for for our company specifically. I am not an exception. Uh, there are a lot of people in our company that have worked uh, for much longer than I have. So we have like what we call, we call them like veterans of the company. They've been there for 25 to 30 years. Um, and the company, this type this company actually um, going back to kind of company values, they, uh, they like loyalty. They like employees who stay with them for a long, long time. And so for me, I guess the reason why I stayed is because I kept changing my, uh, my job within the company. So as I mentioned, I started in marketing and I spent about five years in marketing. And even within marketing, you have such diverse work. So you can do, for example, more um, strategy related things. So when I started, because I had an international relations degree, um, my boss, who was the senior uh, vice president for strategy and marketing, he wanted me to attend a lot of international conferences. So that was kind of right up my, my alley. But then I went to, to do more proposal work. And that's a lot of writing, a lot of researching of what kind of past performance our company has in order to address these new contract requirements. So that was very different again. Then uh, after about five years um, in marketing, I actually transferred into operational work. So that was supporting um, different construction projects. And I wasn't on construction itself, but I had to travel quite a bit to different, um, different locations. Um, and that was very interesting. And I got more into, I saw um, kind of our financial side of things a little bit more. I had to do a lot of reports on uh, revenue and cost and pro, um, project margin. So that was completely different. Um, that's something that I have not dealt with before. And I didn't have um, you know, any background in finance, that was very difficult for me. And that's when I decided, okay, maybe I need to, um, to go back to, to school and, and get my MBA. And that was actually extremely helpful. I loved the MBA program because it was, it was so diverse. You know, you study, you know, the kind of the human side of things. So HR policies, human capital, soft skills, but then on the other hand, you get this, um, the more technical and kind of business skills, um, like how to read financial statements um, and things like that. So I actually, um, to be honest with you, I did consider um, looking for another job and this was about uh, a year ago. And what happened was um, our, uh, the corporation has um, made, out, made an announcement that they have decided to sell the federal division. So it was, um, it was a time of a great uncertainty. Everybody in, um, in our division was very stressed. Um, some people were saying, okay, I have been with this corporation for many, many years, 10 plus years, and all of a sudden they want to sell, because they sell not just the company, they sell people with it too. So if you're working for the federal division, you have to go to your new employer, whoever it is. And so a lot of, there was just um, 
a lot of confusion. A lot of people were saying, I want to go to the commercial sector. I do not want to stay with the federal division because I'm loyal to the company. Then there was another chunk of people who were saying, I don't know anything about commercial world. I've spent my entire career working for federal contracts. I know federal regulations. I know how to write contracts. I know how to interpret contracts. This is my world. So I have to go and you know, whoever is my new employer, it doesn't matter, I'm sticking um, to this one. So I was a little bit uncertain. I, I was certainly not going to go into the commercial um, market because that would mean that I have, to, um, I have to relocate. We don't have commercial capabilities here in Virginia or in DC. Um, so for me, it was important to stay in this area because there's a lot of federal contractors here. So we have another question from Jahan Kaganova. Um, thank you, Yelena. You've mentioned mining and CSR. I wonder if the company you work is, uh, for is cognizant about environmental impact of mining. What the company does to address its environmental impact and uh, she continues, the waste generated by the construction accounts, two thirds of the solid waste global, globally. I wonder if you feel conflicted while working for, for, for Fortune 500 and knowing these negative impacts on the environment. Yes, that's, that's a great question. So I have not worked in the mining uh, business line. So unfortunately I cannot tell you uh, you know exactly what kind of concerns they have. Um, I'm not familiar with that market, but um, I agree that there's always some environmental um, concerns with with any project. And so when our company starts a project, they usually bring in um, multiple experts. So of course, number one is safety expert. Um, and that means, um, that's a di very diverse field. So we can range from just employee safety to equipment safety, um, personal protective equipment as well. So that's kind of one regulation that they have to um, follow very stringently because um, at least in the federal market, they have to, um, to follow federal regulations, what called, what's called OSHA regulations. It's uh, Occupational Safety and, uh, and Health uh, Agency. So, and then they generally uh, bring in um, environmental experts as well, particularly if the client has some environmental um, concerns. So, and I think that uh, corporations definitely need to do more work when it comes to uh, environmental concerns. Uh, it's, just, it's probably not enough what they're doing right now. Um, generally, what you can do, uh, if you're interested, what, uh, what kind of um, environmental uh, policies the company follows, you can go to the website and you can actually look under corporate social responsibility that I mentioned in my, um, in my last slide. And they usually have uh, a section that addresses environmental concerns. So, uh, follow-up question is, OSHA only applies to uh, in United States. So if your company is doing any mining activities in South America or anywhere else, I assume it won't apply. It won't apply, that is correct. And um, I think that in this case, and again, I'm not sure, as I said, I, I have not been on the mining project, uh, but I think that they have to very closely work with the local um, government, the, the um, host. Yes. Um, country government to assess the situation and then figure out, you know, what regulations they need to follow. Um, I have another question. So the, uh, I assume your company is still in federal contracting business. I mean, you're getting jobs from federal government or local governments. So how if you're familiar, it is probably not your area, but how does your company balance political contributions and also uh, lobbying in, uh, in, in DC or in uh, local centers and capitals? Yes, so uh, I probably won't be able to, um, to address this question in a lot of detail, but what I can tell you mm -hmm. 
is we do have uh, an office in Washington, D.C. It's a government relations office, and it strictly deals with just lobbying activities. So uh, I guess for ethical reasons, that office tends to be kind of very siloed. So we don't interact with them a lot. And so we I can't tell you exactly, um, you know, the types of activities they do. I mean, of course, they go, they, they go a lot um, and they attend, you know, congressional meetings. Um, they meet with politicians um, and so on. And they, of course, you know, they try to um, kind of find out information, again, if it's appropriate to, for the politicians to share that information, um, to, to see, you know, of course, where the federal budget is going to go. Because depending on um, the administration that's in place, depending on the political agenda, there may be some projects that we're waiting for that may not be funded this year, for example, and uh, you know some projects may kind of be dying out. So we need to know, okay, should we focus our sales and our marketing efforts on these projects or not? But again, as I said, you know that office tends to be you know very siloed. They're very separate, and uh, uh, we don't interact with them directly. Um. Well, our time is limited, but let me ask the uh, last two questions. Atebek is looking for data, so he's asking how uh, open is your company to cooperate with researchers? I mean, providing data. That's that's a great question, and to be honest with you, I'm not uh, I'm not sure. Um, so I know that we have a department that's more for kind of public relations, but they deal more with reporters and such. So I think most of the, the data you might have to um, look on the website. Now there's a lot of information about like the history of the company. Uh, the financial data is obviously all there. So you can go back to any year and you will see very extensive you know, financial data available. So if you're interested in that, that's available um, on, the, on the website. Um, and then I think depending on, and maybe if you're interested specifically in some kind of project work, then you would have to try and um, you know, go to a particular division. And again, I mean, I'm happy to, to take that offline and if anyone wants to, um, um, send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to um, to communicate. Um, my your mic is open. Last question is: uh, What is your opinion on knowing people within a company or industry while getting hired? Does the impact does that impact our chance of getting hired? I mean, if for instance, in your case, uh, knowing you would impact our uh, chance of being hired by Fleur. Absolutely, it would increase. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that it's it's very, very important. So for me, that's something that I've uh, struggled with in the past because I, I tend to be more of an introvert. So for me, you know, going to events and talking to new people, that's very, that's very difficult. But I think that particularly in the United States, the thing that you keep hearing over and over and over again in corporate environments is this word networking. And I'm sure you all have heard this before. Networking is one of the most important um, things that, that you can do. So you just uh, try to go to um, any type of industry event, um, try to talk to people, um, try to get their business cards, of course. And so what I can tell you about the construction industry, there is some turnover. As I mentioned, you know, a lot of our employees, they tend to stay with, with our company for a very long time, but some people leave, of course, and so try to. I try to keep in touch with um, anyone who has left, um, whether it's you know going through LinkedIn or um, email or phone calls or trying to you know maybe still meet up for lunch or something else, some kind of social gathering, so that you also know what those people are working on, where they are at, how do they like their new company and so on um, and I think that's a great way because you know if, like I said if something were to happen and I was thinking about it last year 
um, as this uncertainty was unfolding, um, where do I go? You know, who do I know? And that, and that was the first question that popped into my mind. Okay, who can I contact to ask about potential employment? So, and, and like I said, I'm very happy to, um, to connect with anyone um, uh, via email as well. And if you have other questions that are specific about our company, I'm happy to, to answer those as well. Uh, well, I said last, but there, there is another one. I think it is interesting. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Will you be climbing the corporate ladders or join many others in investing and starting your own consul consultation or company? That's a great question too. I, I think that for me, uh, I would like to continue climbing the corporate ladder. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, I think, I think if you're trying to get promoted, in a company like ours, when you are younger, may, maybe when you're in your 20s, it's very important to try different things. And company values um, this type of experience. They'll say, oh, okay, so she she's spent maybe a couple of years supporting sales and marketing. So she knows that world. Oh, then she went on to uh, operations, so she knows how project uh, projects run, uh, and then she maybe did something else. Like, uh, for example, I got uh, I got into a lot of training on risk management and quality control. So you kind of have to try and learn as much as you can uh, from different perspectives, so that you understand how it all comes together in a company. Um, and of course, understanding financials. That's extremely important to being a leader. So I think in 10 years, um, hopefully I'm still with this company because I think it's a great company. And uh, hopefully I will be, you know, maybe a vice president or something like that. And maybe you can invite me again. <laughs> uh, yeah, we would love that. But uh, you have to hire several Turkmans. Uh... Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, we need more Turkmen's in our company. I can't hold down the fort, it's just me now. <laughs> so you can diversify your workforce. Absolutely, that's a great plan. Yes, it's not about nepotism. Or, yes. Uh, yes, anyway, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was interesting and I guess it would be helpful uh, for people as well. And they have your email and yes. you may receive some email. Absolutely. That. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Repa. And uh, thank you to all participants for your very interesting questions. And uh, I look forward to more communication. Yes. Uh, and uh, we are concluding our day here. Um, so we will be having another, actually, let me continue in Turkmen. So, uh, Şungulen Cemleyer, Nikep Deneti Polka Startuplar var da kurulmakçı. On Bram Çağan'ın psikologiyatı Emir Nuruf. Karışım yerler var mı? Emir Nuruf'un çıkışı AI, Artificial Intelligence Enhanced Energy Cloud Solution for Smart Buildings and Distributed Energy Resources. Türk Mendil'in ne bölüye Nikep de startup ondan sonra Adam da menlik düşüncesi, maşgala ve sosyal katnaşıkların, katnaşıkların ona ilgilen tehdiri Dildar Ernaz Arvan'ın çıkışını bir hipot hemen birlikte görür. Hemen de katnaşman, katnaşanın için sağ olsun ayarız. Mükep de hem karışarız. Ertiyerine hayırlı olsun. Good afternoon. Akşamın hayırlı olsun. Giyeceğin rahat olsun. Başlaklar olsun. Bol yakıp sağ olmanı. Artı görüşürüz. Thank you very much, Yelena. Uh, Thank you. I hope to see you around then. Absolutely. Have a nice day and weekend. Thank you.